creating curiosity by asking better questions. This is Shed Talk. Jeff Davison, CEO of Calgary's Prostate Center. Hmm, the things you know that you don't know. Jeff Davison. Hey, thanks for being on Shed Talk. Hey, thanks. Do you know what? It's been a while since we met. Like, I've, I've known mm. you for a lot of years, and we've yep. run into, I think, at the bar, garden parties. And, uh, it seems to be every party that's out there. We run into each other, and we're like, hey, you know what we got to do? We got to get together for cigar night. Oh, my gosh. And we always talk about it, and we always do it. Mm-hmm. And it's like mm-hmm. one of those people, everybody out there, they always say when they meet somebody, say, you know what? We got to get together, but nobody puts calls to action. That's right. Yeah. So thank you for putting this on because, uh, you know, finally someone, one of us has taken the initiative. Oh, and I appreciate you coming. And you're enjoying your coffee because you were asking me earlier, mm-hmm. oh, can I bring mm-hmm. my coffee? And I'm going, I don't know. Okay, yeah, I have your coffee on because you drink so much coffee. I do. Three kids working in healthcare. Come on, you need coffee, right? Like, it's got to keep you going. So working in healthcare mm-hmm. and then working and having kids and then being in politics before, is there any correlation between the two? It feels like it's all just politics, right? I mean, when you're raising money and you're hustling and, you know, in a way politics was the perfect sort of leave that to come to this, right? You had a bit of a name, you had a cause you believed in, and you had access to the people you need help to fund something for. And so it just all kind of came together and, and really being at the Prostate Cancer Center now for just a, just under two years um, has just been an incredible time. And what's the biggest challenge with the prostate cancers? You know... It, Besides it, having prostate cancer. Yeah, I mean, it's, <laughs> look, like one in yeah. six Alberta men will now face prostate cancer. It's the fastest growing cancer in men, right? When you take lung cancer out of the equation, which is really the fastest growing amongst the population uh, by gender, prostate cancer is the fastest growing cancer in men. You know, we're now seeing one in six, which is really... Um, I think it's one in eight women are now facing breast cancer, right? So the number of individuals going through this has, has skyrocketed. And so, you know, my constant worry is future funding, right? Always chasing after, you know, that next philanthropic dollar to make sure that uh, as we come into now our 25th year at the Prostate Cancer Center, what does the next 25 years look like for us? And then, and if you were to take that, there was, take the money out of the equation, mm-hmm. hypothetically speaking, say, it's kind of like saying, <clears throat> take starvation out, take, yeah. take hunger away. If, if you were to take out the money aspect of it, would there be a cure for prostate cancer? Well, I can tell you, if you took the money out of the equation. Meaning then... you, money's no <clears throat> object. Let's use it as oh, money. Oh, yeah. No, well, no if, not, if money's no object, maybe. Um, you know, I think the genome project that had started a few years back is really, unlocked a lot of opportunities that researchers are now after it's but it is the funding right if money's no object could we get there faster absolutely um but it's it's tough to tell right i can tell you that if we took all of the funding off the table let's say uh there wouldn't be a solution to this in fact there wouldn't be groups like the prostate cancer center because nobody does what we do and so when you put it into context that the fastest growing cancer in Alberta is this amongst, you know, for men. And if this center didn't exist, well, how would we solve the problem? So when you just mentioned about G-Note, what is mm-hmm. that? So, uh, you know, and I, I don't really know too, too much about the past of it. I mean, I always preface these conversations by saying I'm not a doctor, I'm not a researcher. I'm just, you know, the guy who gets to stand at the front and, and ask for the money and make like it's my parade to some degree. Um, you know, but it's, it's really looking at what I think what people are calling personalized medicine, the idea that everybody's genetic makeup is different, but how do we attack, uh, cancer cells specifically to, to your body, right? So when we think about the various treatments that are out there, what's the best sort of way to put it together and say, if we do this first, that leaves us opportunities on the table, because often what can happen is you go through a cancer treatment with a certain type of drug. And that uh, prohibits you from using other drugs in future if that drug didn't work. And so looking at how we sequence drugs differently and how we, you know, look at you as the individual and what's going to be best for that that particular person, that tends to be sort of what it's all about these days. Hmm. And the one in six, and then you're saying in the prostate world, Mm -hmm. and it's expanding. If you went back five or ten years ago, was that like one in ten? Or is it just a population <clears throat> growth? I think it's because we're the only jurisdiction that's getting out into the community and actively or, or proactively testing men in the community. So when we go out into the community with the man band program, for instance, we, we go to where the men are. We know that men don't often have a family doctor. Frankly, they don't want to talk about their health. 
Um, but we go into the community where they, where they are and make it a more comfortable conversation to say, but you really need to be proactive about this. And so in a jurisdiction like Alberta, where we're constantly testing men over the age of 40, um, you know, that's resulted in that one in six. If you compare that nationally, which I believe is now one in nine, um, which, you know, in, in, in larger rooms, I try to blame on Trudeau. It's easy to say, you know, it's, 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 you know, more people are affected by it here because of him, but we laugh. You're supposed to laugh at these jokes. You know, they're not obviously that funny. Uh, yeah. <laughs> We've got nothing from over here. So that's great. Yeah. Um, but I think that truly is why, like we just, we have early detection here. We have advanced sort of screening here and that's really what has led to that higher number. So as the man ban, are you saying that's the only, it's only in Alberta? Yeah. Yeah, wow. right now it's the only active clinic that goes out into the community anywhere in the world. And why is that? Private funding, right? We're funded by the community for the community. And so a long time ago, uh, there was this sort of thought that if we could catch and diagnose prostate cancer early, we have so many more tools in the toolbox to deal with it. But why doesn't other provinces or states and over follow suit with something like this? Because this is like when you're talking one in six people have this mm-hmm. and then doing that, we can cure and not. And I'm not saying cure it, but if, if you can di- diagnose it, we can at least work with it. Yeah. I, I don't know the simple answer to that, right? I think um, a lot of it comes down to just taking the initiative, right? I'd love to prove out the program we've done here in Alberta uh, and successfully apply it to places like Saskatchewan and Manitoba and BC. Anywhere in particular you have rural remote access problems, that's where something like the man van matters, right? Getting out into those communities and making sure that there is equitable access to health care for the men in those communities, and not just the men, their families as well, right? I mean, we, we forget that men go through prostate cancer, but often it's the caregivers who are with them that also take that journey. So it's the families around these folks that we're trying to, to also support. So these families that are around it, the males are obviously looking, so, so the man van's there. Mm-hmm. Mental health issues with men that don't want to get this tested. <clears> like <throat> when, you, when you look at men, um, oh, I, it's okay. It doesn't hurt. I'm fine. And then, then don't, don't get checked. Don't get looked at. Mm-hmm. How is that effective on their mental health? It, I mean, it's one of the reasons we now have a focus on mental health at the Prostate Cancer Center. We just went through a massive renovation. And one of the things we put in place was this mental wellness center, primarily because, again, men don't like to talk about their health. I mean, we still have, you know, misconceptions going on in the community, like a PSA test is a simple blood test that could save your life. It's not a digital rectal. Nobody's trying to, you know, get into to fingers anywhere that feels uncomfortable. But one of the reasons why guys don't want to talk about it is because they don't want to go and experience that sort of setting, right? And so again, just simply talking to them that come talk to us about whether or not a blood test is right for you is a, is a big factor in getting them to the table to then have a larger conversation about their health. Um, you know, as we catch it earlier, uh, a lot of the challenge becomes, you know, if you're in your 40s, 50s, um, even early 60s, and you're sexually active, a lot of guys say, well, I don't want my prostate taken out because I don't want to lose sexual function. Um, and that loss of sexual function, again, we call prostate cancer the couple's cancer for a reason. That loss of function is sort of that akin to losing your manhood, right? And that's where sort of the mental health pieces fall into what we try to address. And there's a couple of things there that we're doing. Number one, um, we're pioneering a program called prehabilitation, which is, I think, right now, the most comprehensive prehab program in the world. And it's this whole idea of, you know, you wouldn't go run a marathon and then train for it afterwards. So why do we send guys for surgery and then tell them to get healthier after, right? The idea is that prostate cancer is pretty slow growing. So we have opportunities to get guys healthier before the surgery. And the studies have kind of shown us that we think we can reduce the complications. So the post-surgical complications, which are right now about 60% of guys will, you know, have incontinence issues or sexual function issues. We think that we can reduce those complications by 80%, just getting guys healthier going into a surgery. And so it's, again, when you think about if you're healthier coming out and you're sort of more likely to return to what I would call, you know, quote unquote, normalized, you know, your normalized life as you, as you did coming into it the mental health then uh, struggle is is a lot less. So when you're going in and you talk about health, um, being diagnosed with uh, prostate cancer, what's the first sign of prostate cancer in a a male should recognize? That's the problem. There's almost little to no symptoms, right? That's again why early detection matters. That's why we go into the community with the man van to talk about, you know, this is a simple blood test. This could be going on for 10, 15 years, guys, and they won't have 
any idea that it's happening. And this is a slow moving cancer. So obviously, mm-hmm. when you just said 10, 15 years ago, and all of a sudden they get their, their blood check and go, wait a second, you've had yeah. it for, you've had this for 10 years, but it's still slow moving. There's still, yeah. there's still a lot of, and I'm not saying hope or prayer, I'm not saying that, but at least you're, you're working towards something to change. Yeah. Well, and, and think it. about it like this. There's a lot more options for you in terms of treatment, right? Lots of tools in the toolbox if we catch it early. Right. What we don't want to have is, and, and this quite often happens, is, you know, a guy who's 58 years old now has metastatic cancer, shows up to the clinic and says, well, this is the first time I've ever seen a doctor. Right. That's the challenge we have to solve for. Right. Because there's, unlike women, there are very few entry points into healthcare for men. Right. Like from an early age, women are taught, get this checked, you know, go do this, review this. And, and you set from a very early age a cadence within women that means I need to get checked by a doctor annually. We don't do that with men. And then we act surprised when these 58-year-olds show up with metastatic cancer going, well, what do you mean? I didn't think anything was wrong. I, I didn't have any reason to see a doctor. And peeing yellow or peeing red, that's obviously a big sign, well, I'm assuming. Lots of different reasons, right? Okay. You know, that guys would show up and say, I think I just need to see somebody, right? Right. Because I, I, I remember, I go back uh, 10 years ago where I had bladder cancer. Mm-hmm. And the first sign, and, and from speaking from my own experience, was that all of a sudden I was peeing uh, red. Yep. And I was like, oh, is it a yeast infection or is it something like that? And it's like, no, if it, if it's not yellow, g- g- go get it checked. And then that was the first thing. And then b- became a uh, bladder cancer. And I mm-hmm. and to this day, going back, and this was 10, 15 years ago, um, understanding a PSA versus bladder cancer, which are two totally different things, but curable once you get into it early enough mm-hmm. to be able to look at to look at it. And here we are 10 years later. So. Yep. Well, and asking that question. I, you know, it, and we obviously within the Prostate Cancer Center have the Southern Alberta Institute of Urology. So we, we've tried to really broaden the scope in terms of, you know, understanding more kidney, bladder, uh, prostate, the, the urological cancers that exist out there. Um, but fundamentally, the problem is actually that guys just don't pay attention to the symptoms when and where they do exist, right? I mean, with prostate cancer, there's very little symptoms. With bladder and kidney cancers, there's, there's other symptoms that generally speaking, guys ignore until it kind of gets to a point of critical and then they go, okay, well now I should go see a doctor, right? It's that access point into healthcare that we don't take seriously as men. And and frankly, don't want to talk about it with anybody either because that would have to, you know, somehow admit weakness or admit that, you know, you have to have an uncomfortable conversation when it's really just silly, right? I mean, I, I think about one of the great advocates we have at the Prostate Cancer Center is Bret Hart, right? Bret the Hitman Hart. And here's a guy that he gets out there and tells his story, right? And trying to encourage other men to also tell their story. And I, I think to myself often, you know, if we can have the ultimate tough guy out there telling his story, well, why the hell can't I? Why, why can't everybody else type of thing, right? And it, it has to become more accepted for guys to talk about these things so that we do start taking better care of ourselves. Now, have you found that a lot more people are now talking about it more so, uh, say, five years ago to, to today? I think so. I mean... You know, I've been there at the Prostate Cancer Center just just about two years. And, you know, for me coming in, the mission was really drive awareness, right? Create more awareness, get people talking about this at the dinner table, right? It's it's that one cancer that we just, we feel uncomfortable about and we don't want to talk about. And um, we've got to be able to normalize that conversation if we're going to get ahead of it. Is there is there anything that uh, would trigger I, I know you're, you're saying like a PSA, you're going to get your PSA in your blood. Mm-hmm. And we talked a little bit about health, getting into the health aspect of it. Yep. Is there something that people should kind of be aware of to avoid certain foods, certain activities or in that state? I, I, I don't know that it's any of that, right? Because, uh, you know, for, and again, I'm not a doctor, right? Um, but you, you look at the, the, the types of people I see come through our clinic, right? Their moms, their dads, their grandpas, their uncles, their brothers, their pro wrestlers, their iron men, their, you know, guys who are early stage into their eighties. It's, it's all walks of life. I like to kind of think cancer doesn't really discriminate in a lot of ways, right? It, you know, often we have this perception that even, um, prostate cancer is the old white guy disease. Well, I can tell you that two to one, you know, black Caribbean men, indigenous men, and people with family history are twice as likely to have prostate cancer than any other, anybody else. So it doesn't care about your race. It doesn't care about your religion. It doesn't care about your income level, right? Cancer is just, it's going to hit you if it's going to hit you. Now, a question I want to dig down a little bit deeper on the, to ask the question is that if some people come up and say, listen, 
I want to have this conversation with my husband or my mm -hmm. son. Um, how would I go about to introduce this conversation to them to get checked? Not that they have an issue, but to bring it up as a dinner conversation or as a topic up there. Is there, mm -hmm. is there a set process that people will go, okay, now I'm going to go talk. <laughs> I know I need to say this and I know I got to do this. I got to do an intervention because yeah. I'm, I'm concerned. Do people ask about how to do, how do you break through barriers? You know, it, I find that it's hard telling people like, you better go get checked, right? Often again, what I usually say is come talk to us about whether or not a, a simple blood test is right for you, right? Have that conversation with your family doctor, have it with your wife at home, have it with whoever you need to, to sort of build up the encouragement. I mean, that's one, again, one of the reasons we go into the community with the man van is because we make it friendly. You know, you've got volunteers there who've been through this before. You have, you know, our nursing team there, our man van team that's there, just all to sort of spark the conversation with men, right? Um, I think there, there tends to be this conversation of, well, what I don't know can't hurt me type of thing, right? And that's, that's not what we should be thinking about. We should be thinking about how do we be proactive. And so if it's, you're sitting at home at the dinner table with, you know, you're a wife talking to the husband or a kid talking to dad, it doesn't matter. That sort of encouragement to say, it's just a simple blood test. Why not? What and reason do, do you have not to? Yeah, and doing that simple blood test, a lot of people, then all of a sudden they get on the Google and then all of a sudden they go down the Google uh, oh, Pandora yeah. box yeah. and they'll go, oh Love Dr. Google. Oh, yeah. yeah. Dr. Google knows everything, right? You know, <laughs> And let me throw a little AI oh, into yeah. that as yeah, well. Yeah. yeah, absolutely, right? If you ever want to be terrified, just Google anything, right? Oh, and, and it's been absolutely, when you look from for the last 10 years and go into now, now throw AI into the mix, and it's got to be really challenging because now everybody's, oh, it's over. Now I, I got to be into, I got to get in right now. I mm -hmm. got to see the doctor today. It's going to spread forever. And then whatever that storytelling will be. And it, it's, it's quite scary for a lot of people that... Yeah. It's not the fact of having it, mm -hmm. uh, knowing that say you had cancer or you have it. It's the fact of not knowing if you have it or don't have it because it's the not knowing part. Yeah, and again, when you have a disease that has little to no symptoms, you know, the not knowing part is the scary part, right? If again, it's better to know. It's better to find out because then we have lots of tools that we can address it with, and often that just comes with active surveillance. We'll just watch you over the next few years and see how things go. But it's better to know than not know. Because again, when it gets to that point of metastatic cancer, um, you know that that's a different beast to have to try and treat. Oh man, it's it's, it's incredible when you think about how many men don't actually get checked, and yeah. this is a big concern with people to say, listen, the PSA, it's, it's just it's just a blood test. Yeah. Well, and you know, you think about uh, not just Alberta across this country. There's just you know rural remote access, for instance, again. You know, just the lack of access to healthcare professionals that they have, right? It's that's why we go into rural communities. It's why we're trying to prove a concept with the provincial government, with the federal government, to say you can do rural remote care differently, right? And even again, going back to what I said about our, our prehabilitation program, all of, as well as our mental health program. All of these things now we've incorporated technology into. So, you know, I don't expect that a guy's going to jump off a combine and drive to Calgary and say, I, I need to talk about my mental health. Well, now we can have a much better conversation online with it as well, right? Incorporating that virtual care piece has been um, a game changer for us in the province because now we, we can provide that access of equitable care across the province, right? The inputs are there. It's whether or not we get people to take them up now and use them. That's the question. So when you're talking about remote, and mm -hmm. I want to dig down a little bit deeper because you're asking that question. So if I'm on the, on the combine, I need to have a quick question. I want to, you now is it like a Zoom or is it just pick up the phone and call? Um, just what's an easy access to have that conversation with somebody? It and really, I'm not saying I'm on a combine. I'm just say at home sure. in a rural community. And yeah, I mean, answers. I think it's, you know, again, um, rural communities are just so much less likely to have a, a family doctor in the community, right? And so it's trying to provide those initial points of access into the care, which is, again, you go out into the community where the man van is, you come and see us, they say, okay, well, the, one of the questions we ask on there is, do you have a family doctor? And if not, we'll help you figure out how to find one. Um, you know, we try to also think about sort of how do we navigate patients through the various types of the journey they're going to go through, right? Some of it is just, you know, returning a simple, hey, good news, your, your blood test came back fine, you know, no need to panic, hope we see you next year in the community type of thing, right? All the way through to, you know, we're, we now need to refer you to a urologist. You'll come into the clinic. We'd like you to be seen. We'll run secondary and third tests where we need to. Uh, and then you start down a different path. But once you've started that path, it's, 
we expect you to go home and live your normal life, right? And we want to make sure you're living your normal life to the best of your ability. Again, part of the barrier in, in providing access to healthcare is just distance. And so if we can utilize programs, you know, like the mental health program, like the prehab program, like the nurse navigator program, all of these things that can be done in a virtual setting, why wouldn't we? And even to the point where, you know, you take our mental health program, a lot of it is, I think people have Zoom overload, right? We're tired of looking at faces on screens. And so one of the ways we've even set up the rooms can be, you could have a counselor in the room, you could have a patient in the room, but maybe the patient says, well, you know, I, I'd feel much more comfortable if my brother who lives in Halifax was part of this conversation. Great, dial them in, right? Bring them into the conversation. It's trying to create the environment, not just sort of the face on the screen that matters in virtual care. And that's important because a lot of people will be sitting there and then they're going, oh, I don't want to miss anything. Mm -hmm. Let's make sure my brother's there and have this conversation so that we've heard everything correctly and asked the right questions so that we can get the right results. Well, and, and once we've been diagnosed with cancer, I mean, that's all you hear, right? And that's all you kind of focus on through the next little part of your journey. And so that idea that other people can now be in the room or online with you as part of that conversation, you get somebody taking notes and asking the questions for the family and whatever those things are. You know, again, we've recognized that it's not just the patient that goes through this journey. It's often the people around them that take the journey with them. So how do you bring them into it? Even um, looking at some of our um, peer support groups, uh, some of our uh, caregiver groups, you know, again, providing caregivers in sort of room sessions where you've got a group of people that are just supporting the individuals going through cancer. But, you know, bringing other people in virtually to those classes makes sense as well because, you know, it's hard for somebody to say, well, I'm going to drive to Calgary from Lethbridge, let's say, you know, just to attend a one-hour session on, on, you know, how I deal with my partner at home who has cancer, right? Yeah, that's very interesting. And thinking about, is there like a... Is there like a line, like a 1-800 line as well going through this or, or there will be numbers for them to reach out to say, okay, your spouse or your husband or whatever has this disease, or has cancer, here's, here's a number to call to help you through the yeah, process. Yeah, it's a bit of a decision tree. Like once okay. you've kind of come into the process, then it's sort of where do we navigate you through to, right? And sometimes the services are outside of the scope of what we offer. And so having those partners across the province also matter, right? So for instance, mental health. Um, some of the issues you know, maybe don't surround prostate cancer directly. And so we'll partner with various groups in, in, in and around the province to make sure that that individual gets the care they need. Interesting. Uh, the man van. How many man vans are there in Alberta? We have two right now, yeah. building a third that'll come online here beginning of July. Uh, and, uh, you know, looking to probably put another one together. I mean, they're getting on... Uh, 20 some odd years old now. And so it's, these, these are some of the replacements we're starting to build, but um, two to three makes sense for the province uh, based on the population that we have and just the places we're going. And so. Yeah. And most of the traveling is during the summertime or wintertime or, or is it, does it, it's just all year round? Well, you know, it was funny because one of the things that we did was, um, you know, community events tend to happen spring, summer, fall, right? And so those months in the wintertime, uh, we recognize that, you know, guys are still being diagnosed with cancer in February, right? Uh, we put retail units together for the man van team. So the trucks will go out, but you don't have to stand in a parking lot waiting to get a blood test. We'll actually go into malls and conventions and trade shows and whatever the indoor show will be with sort of an indoor retail setup so that we can still provide that care in the community. And uh, when you look at convention centers, they usually give you those spaces just to help out. You're, you're, we're not paying for those spaces, or, or do they rent? Often babies? we get a discount, but you're still paying to be there, type of thing. Okay, I was yeah. kind of curious because yeah. they say, oh, there's always a profit somewhere yeah. in, when they're looking at that s aspect of it. Now, on the mental illness or mental health side mm -hmm. versus 10 years ago to where it is now in mindset and in males, mm -hmm. um, where we go back and we never ever heard much about, well, PTSD you did, mm. um, but then all of a sudden now mental health is the forefront mm. of the buzzwords right now. Yeah. Do you see that different from 10 years ago? I think it's different from three years ago, right? I mean, I think COVID really sort of perpetuated more issues in and around mental health. And so I think the need has never been greater. Um, I think you go back 10, 20 years ago, sure, it was starting to be talked about. You're right. It was sort of more of a you know, that PTSD flavor in men. And, you know, we didn't really talk about it otherwise. Um, but I think that through sort of coming out of COVID, it has really become uh, a major issue in society. And so we're starting to think differently about mental health now. We're starting to think about, 
it's not just sort of, you know, you used to talk about mental health, like, well, the people on the streets, you know, they've got mental health issues. That's why they're, that's why they're doing opioids. It goes so much further than that now, right? It's, um, it's into just about every issue now and, you know, starting to recognize how we deal with those issues and, and how we create better patient care um, that incorporates mental health um, it, it is a big focus, I think, just everywhere right now. And when you look at uh, mental health and all of a sudden, I, and, and I look back, going back for the years, the woke crowd, um, and I use woke quite loosely just because sure. I'm, I'm in my 50s right now. So when you go back and you and uh, uh, gender and we, we mm. get into the LBGQ and then stuff like this, and then we talk about, and, and we'd mentioned this a little earlier about, we talk about the man van mm-hmm. and we talk about mental health. And then, yes, what about transgender for that part of it. So we, we yeah. talked a little bit about that. I mean, it's it's a changing world, right? I mean, we're a clinic that is open to everyone for everyone, right? Um, I would say the vast majority of the patients that come through the clinic, which is about, you know, just through the clinic, it's about 22,000 visits a year. Um, you know, the, the vast majority are, are identify as male. Um, but as we start to think about um, other things going on in the world, you know, individuals who were biologically born uh, male that are now identifying as female. Some of them have gone through transition surgery. Um, We're starting to see cases now of individuals who identify as women with prostate cancer because what happens in a lot of these, and and again, I always preface it that I'm not a doctor, um, we don't often remove organs that are problematic in transitional surgeries. And so there are cases now where we're starting to, to see those pop up. And it's interesting that you don't have to feel sheltered and you don't have to feel ashamed just show up and you still get the same PSA test and then exactly just move forward. Yeah. I mean, we just think about it like we're here for the community, right? Everybody in our community matters and we want to make sure that we've got entry points into healthcare for all those individuals who are facing these things. And I mean, you know, the, the stigma, the amount of mental health challenges that just individuals going through, um, you know, trans identity and all of those things that are associated with it is just so much more. And so, you know, trying to take the extra steps to be a clinic that is inclusive is important to us. Awesome. Now, here we go, Jeff Davison, well, CEO of Calgary Prostate, been there a couple of years, mm-hmm. ran, well, ran for mayor. Mm-hmm. How was that experience? <laughs> well, I didn't win, so it wasn't great. Um, no, you know, it's funny because I think you get together with sort of the people that you go through that with and other candidates and, you know, you talk a lot about just sort of the outcome. And, uh, you know, for me, I would say, everybody who went into that campaign is still standing there today with me, right? And, you know, you don't see that very often. I think when you're genuine about who you are and what you'd want to try to achieve for society and, um, you know, you start to recognize that there's lots of impact you can have on community without having to be elected, um, you just put all these things together, which is primarily how I ended up at the Prostate Cancer Centre. Um, wanted to still create impact, wanted to make a difference, wanted to drive awareness, you know, wanted to help raise money. All of those things led to the job I'm in. Um, but it was an experience, I'll tell you that. But I think it was a different experience too, because, I mean, again, we were coming out of COVID. Um, we had a federal election in the way. There, there was just, it was all kinds of craziness. I mean, in a way, it seemed it was so different than probably every other campaign environment I almost felt ripped off a little bit. Like you didn't get to quite experience the fun of actually running a campaign, just all the stress and downside. And being a city councillor as well. So, mm-hmm. so going in there and, and serving the public and serving the people. Mm-hmm. And here you are again today, okay, through COVID, through the whole aspect of everything that's happening. Mm-hmm. Now, like you just mentioned, you didn't get to really experience the joy of the campaign. Yeah. Uh, if there is a joy, I don't really know. You yeah. know, people who've done it before might tell you, what, what do you mean there's joy? There's no joy. Yeah. yeah I don't want to be a part yeah. of the public yeah, service. Exactly. Like, These guys are going to crucify exactly. me or whatever that's going to be. So uh, what does the future look like for you? I don't know. You know, I, I'm, I'm happy doing what I'm doing. I mean, I think raising money and being part of a charity that's making a difference is um, incredibly rewarding. Um, but I, you know, I'd be lying if I said I didn't look sort of at what city council's up to these days and start to think, boy, there's, there's a lot of things they're missing on and they seem to be on the wrong side of just about every issue these days. And, you know, more and more, I just think it's, it's perpetuating this narrative that um, we're tired of being told what council's going to do when we used to be asked. And if it was up to us to put these people in these seats again, I don't think they would. And so what that opportunity looks like going forward, I don't, I don't know yet. Hmm. Things you know that you don't know, creating curiosity and asking better questions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, Jeff, 
thank you very much for being on Shed Talk. Hey, Enjoy you. your coffee. Yeah, thank you. Did, did thank you for allowing me to yeah, co-sponsor it, this with the Tim Hortons folks. With the coffee. Yeah. Thanks again and for being on. I really appreciate it. And uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Now you know. Shed Talk.